please uh, put your mobile phones on silent please also fill in the questionnaire so you can get your feedback and develop our upcoming uh, events please note that simultaneous interpretation is available translation will be available thank you and then from Matilda the compassionate the merciful ladies and gentlemen peace be with all of you on behalf of His Excellency Dr. Jamal Sanad Suedi, Director General of the Emirates Center for Strategic Studies and Research, I would like to welcome all of you this evening with the, the UAE India Relations session, which will be given by His Excellency Mr. N uh, Amdeep Navdeep Suri, the Ambassador of India to the UAE. His Excellency Mr. Deep Suri started working for the uh, Indian Embassy in uh, 1993. He worked in uh, Cairo, represented uh, India in Cairo, Damascus, Washington, D.C., Dar es Salaam, and London. He also worked as the Consul General in Johannesburg. He also handed, hand headed the West Africa and Public Diplomacy Division at the Ministry of External Affairs. Uh, prior to his current assignment in the UAE, he was uh, India's uh, High Commissioner to Australia and uh, Ambassador to Egypt. His innovative views uh, of uh, social media and diplomacy is public diplomacy. His, uh, his, ex his Excellency, Amir Deep Suri, speaks Arabic and French, and he holds a Master's degree in economics. He also has uh, uh, his publications about India's policy in Africa, public diplomacy, and uh, the IT outsourcing industry. He also translated his grandfather, uh, Nak Singh's classic Punjab novels into English, which were published by Penguin as the watchmaker and uh, by Harper Collins as uh, a life a life incomplete. His uh, innovative use uh, of social media and public diplomacy has received extensive recognition and earned him uh, two prestigious awards. Now, it's an honor and a pleasure to call upon His Excellency, Mr. Uh, Navdeep Suri, to give his speech, please. In the name of Allah, the compassion of the merciful, thank you very much uh, for this uh, wonderful occasion. God willing, we will be talking about the UAE-India relations but uh, if it is possible, I will speak in English. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thank you very much for this exceptional opportunity uh, to me to uh, speak to you about relations between India and the United Arab Emirates. Now, for many of our friends in UAE, it seems odd to even speak about India-UAE relations because everybody is so familiar with them. In fact, uh, as we were chatting in the majlis, there are friends here in Abu Dhabi, in Dubai, in Sharjah, in Ras al Khema, whose relationship with India goes back three or four generations. And so me, who's only been here for about two years, uh, how much can I tell you, uh, those who are from the UAE, about uh, the relationship between our countries? But nevertheless, um, allow me to begin with a bit of a historical perspective before I come on to the present times and particularly on the remarkable transformation that we are seeing in the last couple of years. I think it would be fair to say that India has enjoyed exceptionally close ties with the Gulf region as a whole before it was recognized as different entities um, over the millennia. There's enough evidence of relations between the Indus Valley civilization and the Mesopotamian civilization that go back to 2000 BC, so about 4,000 years back. More pertinently, I think when we look at the medieval period, the Islamic period, uh, we know for a fact that the first influence of Islam into India came into the southern state of Kerala. And India's oldest mosque uh, was built in Kerala during the time of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, while he was still alive. 
that's how the old, the, that part of the relationship uh, is between our countries. In the medieval period, we are aware that the monsoon winds had been mastered by the Arab sailors. Um, the sailors from this part of the world had an exceptional knowledge of navigation. And in fact, if the legends are accurate, when Vasco da Gama came looking for India and he was searching along the east coast of Africa, somewhere near present day Mozambique, he ran into an Arab captain who showed him the way to get to India by riding the monsoon winds. Particularly when we look at the field of trade, those relations between the Malabar coast and Gujarat and the traders from this part of the world were thriving for centuries. India was the place from where you brought textiles and spices and uh, other exotic stuff. And from here, it went on to Egypt, and from Egypt, it went on to Europe. Um, and uh, this was the trading route. And when you look at the Malabar history of that period, it's interesting to see how the rulers of Calicut firmly believed in what in today's terms would be called a free market economy. Uh, you read about the openness of the trading regime. You read about how traders from different parts of the world were welcomed. They would come with the monsoons, spend a couple of months, three months, four months, five months, buy all the stuff that they needed, develop relationships while they were in Kerala. And then when the monsoon winds changed direction, they would come back. And that relationship continued pretty much until the arrival of the Europeans on the scene. And in fact, it's an interesting quirk of history that the Europeans were not seeking free trade. They were seeking a monopoly on trade. And the first use of gunboat diplomacy uh, was seen in our part of the world when the traditional trading links between India and the Gulf were disrupted first with the advent of the Portuguese. And if ever you have the opportunity to have a conversation with His Highness Dr. Sultan bin Qasim, uh, the ruler of Sharjah, he has done extensive research and written a lot about uh, the, the links between uh, uh, India and the Gulf during that period. But the Portuguese came, and the Dutch came, and the French came, and the English came. And all of them had a certain business model uh, that they used, uh, which was how the, can I have a monopoly on the most lucrative trade route in the world, and how can I use my superior naval forces to establish that monopoly, uh, and, and then I will establish forts along the coast, coast of uh, the Gulf region uh, so that I can dominate the sea lanes and preserve and protect my trade monopoly. But then, as the British established their rule in India, and they struck an agreement with the Trucial states at that time, the relationship underwent a change. Now, you had a political agent sitting here, and in Bahrain, and in other places. And that political agent, curiously enough, reported to the masters in Bombay, not in London. And so very much for the next 100 years, this became part of the British sphere of influence, but operating out of India rather than out of London. The rupee became the currency here, and it remained so till 1967. In fact, in 1967, when India devalued the rupee, that is the time that the government here decided that they were not going to devalue, and the idea first of a Gulf rupiah, and then of the rial, and then of the uh, dirham came up. I still meet friends in Dubai and Sharjah who 
use the word rupee when they talk about uh, any currency. And through the 20th century, particularly in the earlier part with the rise of the pearl industry here, we had a new turn in the relationship. I was reading a book, in fact, the gentleman who, uh, who uh, wrote it, he's 94 years old, he lives in uh, Dubai, and he came here in the 1940s when his older brother was already here for many years. And you read his book and it gives you a really nice insight into life here in the 1930s and 40s and 50s uh, for the Indian merchants who were coming here. And there are stories about how when the merchants came from Bombay and from Gujarat and from Sindh, from Karachi, they were awaited by the uh, pearl divers because they would come with the cash and then the captain would buy the supplies and b having bought the supplies, he would set sail for a two month, three month period for, uh, for looking for the pearls. And then when the pearls were obtained, the buyers again were the Indian merchants. Uh, so it was a, the only real relationship at that time was really with the Indian coast. And then we come to the post-Federation period, 1971 and the oil boom in 1973. And we start seeing the first contours of another change. As the construction boom started in Dubai and in other Emirates, we started seeing a large influx of Indian workers coming in, and of course from other countries as well. And with that, perhaps the character of the Indian community, which until then was largely a merchant community, also started changing. And again, I was having this conversation in Dubai with some of the old timers who are now third or fourth generation here. And it's interesting to see um, them relate stories uh, about the time of uh, His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid and his ambitious plans to deepen Dubai Creek and how he floated a bond to, to raise money for the, uh, for the dredging of Dubai Creek. And it was the Indian merchants who were the first ones to subscribe to those bonds and finance the, uh, the Dubai Creek project. I heard stories of how some of them were the first ones to have generators. And so when Deva, or at that time the Dubai Electricity Authority was formed, they became the original shareholders in Deva. How many of us today remember that? And this one person who's 94 years old, going by his stories, he's the founder member of Deva. He's the founder member of Emirates uh, Bank, what is now e Emirates NBD. And my friends in Emirates Bank tell me that he has never missed a board meeting in the last 50 years. Um, that's a unique relationship. And despite that, somewhere over the next couple of decades, as the Indian economy started growing, as we started our economic reforms, as UAE became wealthier, more prosperous, more developed, I think both of us started looking in different directions. Um, maybe we were complacent, maybe our priorities shifted, uh, maybe there were there's a mismatch of perceptions, but the reality, which I shouldn't deny, is that there was a period of neglect, at least at the political level. And for us, when we diplomats measure these exchanges and interactions, perhaps the most stark admission is that after the visit of Mrs. Indira Gandhi in 1981, for 34 years, there was no Indian Prime Minister who came to UAE. The next one was Prime Minister Narendra Modi in August 2015. And so while we could, if we wanted to, say everything is fine, but the reality was that UAE had slipped down in the Indian consciousness and UAE itself had found other priorities to focus on. 
And then when you look at what's happened in the last three years, it's nothing short of transformational. It's nothing short of dramatic. We signed something called the Comprehensive Strategic Partnership Agreement. And us diplomats like these long, impressive sounding uh, terminologies, Comprehensive Strategic Partnership Agreement. And it's almost a cliche in diplomaties that many of these agreements and MOUs remain pieces of paper. Uh, they are nice to see as declarations of intent, but how much do they really mean in practical terms? So I want to just point to two big ideas. The strategic is a very broad, very large term. I want to point to two big ideas on how, in my opinion, those words of strategic partnership that are, were articulated by His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi and Deputy Supreme Commander of Armed Forces, and Prime Minister Narendra Modi are being translated into reality. The first plank, I would say, is the institutional framework for our bilateral engagement. And that's important because, as I said, there was a period of a couple of decades when high-level visits were few and far between. Since August 2015, His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed went to India in February 2016. He was, as an exceptional gesture, our chief guest on our Republic Day in January 2017. And that was our way of telling the word and telling our own people that this is a truly special relationship, that we are celebrating the visit of the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi on our biggest stage. Our Prime Minister was back here in February 2018, and that makes UAE one of the very few countries that he has visited twice during his term in office. We have a strategic dialogue that takes place not once but twice a year to keep that momentum of engagement going. The next round is in November in Delhi. We have a high-level task force on investment headed by His Highness Sheikh Hamid bin Zayed Al Nahyan from the UAE side and our Commerce and Industry Minister from India. And that will be meeting next week in Bombay. The Minister of Defense, Minister of State for Defense, Mr. Mohammad Al Bawadi, will be visiting India next week as well. And again, when you look at the kind of agenda that is being set for the visit, uh, you know that there is a qualitative transformation taking place. In December, our foreign minister will be here for a joint commission meeting. And when you look at the architecture being put in place for our engagements in security, in consular matters, and a whole range of other areas, even between think tanks like this one, like the Emirates Policy Center, you can see that there is now a proper institutional arrangement that gives some depth to the strategic partnership. But still, is that adequate? Is it enough for us to say that because top levels of government are meeting regularly, that is strategic? Or is there more to it? To my mind, it comes down to the linkages between the two countries to see are they of a strategic nature. And I would like to point out three or four specific areas where I believe the transformation that the relationship is undergoing is truly of a strategic nature, which means it's long term. The first is energy. Now, it's easy to say that India and UAE have always been energy partners. What did it mean? It meant that UAE is a major producer of energy, India is a major consumer of energy, and we have an active buyer-seller relationship. And that was about it. But in the last two years, what we've seen is India has obtained its first concession in a producing oil field in Abu Dhabi. And that's important because our oil companies were going from 
Vladivostok to Venezuela in their search for energy security. And yet, we were not present in the Gulf. And because the doors were opened in UAE, soon thereafter, we got concessions in Oman as well. And now we are participating act actively in the next round of bidding. ADNOC became our partner in our first strategic petroleum reserve near Mangalore, a six million barrel reserve. And once that is completed, there are already discussions for a second one. To my mind, that is strategic, that ADNOC is keeping its oil in our strategic res reserve for our emergency use. We are setting up the world's largest integrated refining and petrochemical complex in a place called Ratnagiri, south of Bombay. We anticipate an investment of $44 billion into that project. The two strategic partners for that project are ADNOC and Saudi Aramco, each committing to put in 25%. So together, they become 50% partners in what is going to be a huge, huge project. But more importantly, one that not only gives UAE a stake in that project, but also an assured market for UAE oil into that refining complex. I could go on, but to me, some of these developments that we've seen recently translate a transactional buyer relationship into something that is of a much more fundamental and strategic nature. Because once these relationships, these linkages take shape, we have stakes in each other's prosperity and stability. The second one is on trade and investment. Now, we've always liked to say that we are UAE's largest or second largest trading partner, and UAE is our third largest trading partner after China and the United States. And that's true. Many people don't realize, many Indians don't realize, that our $52 billion bilateral trade last year meant, and our $32 billion of exports to UAE last year meant that UAE is a bigger market than France or UK or Germany or Japan. It sounds counterintuitive, but it's true. But on the investment side, we've always felt that we could do more, we could do better. And for me particularly, as the ambassador here, it was a challenge that the UAE is a capital rich country, the India is a capital poor country, and yet all you need to do is go to the free zones in Jabal Ali or Hamaria or Ras al Khaimah or Fujaira and see huge Indian investments in all of those zones. So the flow of capital was in the reverse direction. And there were good reasons for that. You know, UAE has done an exceptional job in making itself business friendly. It has done an exceptional job in promoting, marketing itself. And we, frankly, were slow. We acquired a reputation as of a country that was difficult to do business in. But that is changing. India is moving up steadily in the ease of doing business. We moved up 32 places in the space of one year, which is the fastest climb that any country has done in terms of the World Economic Forum uh, rankings. And as a result of that, but more importantly, as a result of the political commitment and direction from the highest levels, the joint statement during Prime Minister Modi's visit said that the UAE would invest $75 billion into Indian infrastructure. That is not a commitment that UAE has made lightly. It's not a commitment that I recall UAE making to any other country. And we are beginning to see those flows take place. Abu Dhabi Investment Authority, Adia, is taking the lead. And they have, over the last year and a half, made some very significant investments into the highways, real estate, housing, renewable energy, and a host of other sectors. They've become the anchor investors in India's National Infrastructure Investment Fund with a billion dollars. And they are setting up a separate platform to invest in India's 
non-performing assets. So we see that as a huge vote of confidence, but more important, we see that as a strategic intent from His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed and from His Highness Sheikh Hamid bin Zayed on where they want to go in this relationship. And it's not just Adia. If you talk today to DP Word or MR or some of the other major players here and look at the way they are approaching the Indian market, DP Word already handles 30% of India's container traffic. It has five major ports that it's operating. And it has ambitions so large that they've already committed a $3 billion investment into Indian logistics and infrastructure sector. Imar is doing something similar. And in fact, diversifying to enter into the food security sector. What these linkages that are coming up will do is tie the two nations together into that strategic vision that the leadership has set up for us. Um, I could expand on that, but uh, with the uh, uh, constraints of time, I would just move to a couple of other areas. And these are important. One is the current generation of leadership clearly sees the imperative of closer ties between our countries. But when you look at the previous generation who had such a strong emotional connect with India, as I said, for many persons from the older generation, whether it was trade or tourism or healthcare or education, India was the only place that was there. How do we encourage the younger generation to establish some of that same connection that the older generations had? Because if we want a bright future for this relationship, then it has to have a buy-in from the younger generation. It has to restore some of the linkages that were there between the elders. Um, I must say that the government here is extremely um, seized of this. I've had a couple of very encouraging discussions with Her Excellency Minister Shamal Mazrui, Minister for Youth, and I hope that we are going to be able to put in place some framework, some platforms that will see younger people connect with each other much more actively, much more vigorously. Culture remains important, and one of the things that we don't see enough is uh, an understanding of each other's cultures beyond the superficial parameters. I meet a lot of my Emirati friends who love Bollywood. Uh, and, and, and many who can sing a song or two uh, when the occasion uh, uh, arises. But there's an India beyond that. And frankly, there are stereotypes on both sides that need to be tackled. And unless we start understanding each other's cultures proactively, um, we will see that gap. And so we made a modest beginning earlier this year. We were the guest of honor at the Abu Dhabi Music and Art, and Art Festival. And that was important because it brought Indian culture out of the cocoon of the Indian community and into mainstream uh, audiences. We are going to be the guest of honor at the Abu Dhabi International Book Fair next year. And that provides us an opportunity to undertake some translations of each other's literatures, each other's works into Arabic or into Indian languages. And in January, Sharja Book Fair is going to be the guest of honor at the New Delhi International Book Fair. And we expect His Highness Sheikh Sultan uh, to go for that, given his passion both for books and for India. And finally, before I conclude, I do want to place a special emphasis on the role of the Indian community in UAE in terms of strengthening this bridge between our countries. I shouldn't even say strengthening the bridge. In, a, in many ways, they are the bridge between our countries. Um, depending on which estimates you take, um, I think the UAE data says that there are about 3.1 million Indians in, uh, in UAE. 
The International Organization of Migration says about 3.3 million. But there was something in the last study of the International Organization of Migration that caught my attention. It said the India-UAE corridor is today the second busiest corridor after the Mexico-US corridor. I was joking with some of my Emirati friends that while in one case they are trying to build a wall, in the other case they are trying to have more flights. In, in fact, we had civil aviation talks today in India. And currently we have 1,065 flights a week between India and UAE. 150 flights a day. And those are not enough. Uh, that's how uh, intense the, the, the connectivity is. There are three or four other ways that the Indian community contributes to the relationship. At a very basic level, the remittances that they send back from their earnings create a real bond uh, between the families in India and this country. But increasingly, we are also seeing investments. You are seeing here in Abu Dhabi, um, business groups like Dr. B.R. Shetty's NMC Healthcare or UAE Exchange, you're seeing uh, Yusuf Ali's uh, Lulu Group and so many others, which are seen with pride as Emirati companies that are going global. NMC Healthcare is listed in London Stock Exchange and it's in the, it's in the FTSE 100 with a market cap of about $10.5 billion today. Now these are champions that UAE has produced, but who are also today investing back in India in a significant way. I see this trend growing in the co coming years where the Indian community, Indian business community here ends up being a player in UAE, in India and globally. So you're seeing multinationals emerge through the Indian business community here. And lastly, in terms of where do we go? I think we've been blessed with the vision of the leadership. Anyone who has seen Prime Minister Modi and His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed together has seen the chemistry between them, the very warm personal relationship, their willingness and ability to pick up the phone and talk to each other at, sh at short notice, and really provide a direction and a guidance that bodes very well for the future for both of us. I see this as an exceptionally important relationship for both our countries in the future. And in a sense, I also see it as an effort to reclaim our past when we were in the same security zone, when we saw that the Arabian Sea is a narrow stretch of water that separates two countries that are near neighbors. Uh, and so in that near neighborhood, we will continue to have those shared interests, whether it comes to maritime security, whether it comes to fighting violent extremism and terrorism, or a whole range of other issues. But those are matters that we can discuss further. Thank you very much for this opportunity, and I look forward to engaging with you. Shukran, Saadat Safir. would like to thank His Excellency uh, Ambassador Navdeep Suri for this wonderful lecture. Now we'll open the floor, please. Uh, stand up and uh, ask your question if you have any questions and please make your question br as brief as possible so we'll be able to uh, take as many questions as possible please hello can you hear me hello hello is it working uh, thank you very much uh, your excellency the ambassador my name is Khaled Omar uh, I'm a journalist uh, your, your excellency do you believe uh, that uh, the relationship uh, between uh, India and the UAE, do you believe that this relation between the UAE and India uh, was much stronger in the past than the past? The, in the past, uh, we had uh, more culture, and even in the 60s, we had a stronger relationship uh, with the media between both uh, countries. Now, as your Excellency have highlighted, it foc you focus on economy, and you have briefly touched the issue of culture. Do you expect 
in the future that we will have a strong cultural relationship? This is my first question. My second question, at the beginning of your lecture, you mentioned that the first mosque to be built in India was at the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him. I just want to clarify this point. You mentioned that uh, the total number of uh, the Indian uh, expat community here, we in the Writers' Union, from time to time we see some uh, Indian writers participating with us. But up till now, we have not seen a, a, a joint cultural project for translation and cultural interaction between the two countries. Do you have the, Indies, the Indian state, and of course for the UAE, do you have an agenda or let's say official joint projects for translation and cultural exchange? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you are absolutely right. Um, it is, I'm a great believer personally that cultural ties are what insulate the relationship from ups and downs. If the cultural ties are strong, then even if the politics changes occasionally, the relationship stays firm and strong. Um, which is why I mentioned that we have, from our embassy, renewed the efforts. I acknowledge that there's been a lapse for a while. Um, it bothers me that too much of the cultural activity that takes place, and there's plenty that happens, is largely within the Indian community. It doesn't connect outside the Indian community. And so our effort when we do the kind of partnerships that I've mentioned with uh, the Abu Dhabi uh, Music and Arts Festival, with the uh, Abu Dhabi International Book Fair, with the Sharjah uh, Book Fair, the intent here is to create dialogues between, in, in individual, between intellectuals. Um, with the Abu Dhabi International Book Fair, we are actually working on a list of books which can be translated by the uh, two sides. You are seeing Indian writers come to the Emirates Literature Festival and to the Sharjah Book Fair and to other events, but that is in a multilateral context where there are many countries present. So it's not an India Sharjah or India UAE engagement happening. What we are trying to do really is to remedy that, recognize the importance of that, and see how we can, from our side, be the catalysts in bringing the uh, cultural personalities of the two sides together beyond Bollywood. I mean, many of us like Bollywood, but there is opportunity beyond that as well. You, you, I would welcome any ideas, I would welcome any initiatives that you suggest. Uh, we would be delighted to take those forward, whether it's from the Writers' Union or uh, any other entity. I would encourage you to visit some of the uh, major literature festivals in India take a team with you from here and see the vibrant intellectual scene that, is, uh, that has developed in India uh, over the last few years. Thank you, Excellency. We'll take one more question. Please. Hussein al Hermuzi from the Emirates Center. Thank you very much, Mr for your kind lecture. I had a question regarding uh, India. Does, does India have an active space program? And if so, is there any aspirations for cooperation with the UAE on that front? Thank you. Uh, India has a very large and very active space program. We currently have something like 34 or 35 satellites in space doing a range of work from weather forecasting to remote sensing. We um, sent a probe to Mars. Uh, we are planning a manned flight to the moon in a couple of years. Um, we have a launch vehicle that has now done 34 consecutive successful launches. Um, I don't know if you saw last year uh, in uh, February, actually this year, an Indian rocket launched 111 satellites in one launch. Many of these were nanosatellites, but one of those nanosatellites was a UAE satellite uh, that was launched on an Indian vehicle. Um, I'm very pleased that the former chairman of the Indian Space Research Organization has become a member on the advisory board of the UAE Space Agency. 
and there are active discussions taking place on a range of areas. Uh, I like to say that in terms of India-UAE relationships, the sky is the limit, the space is the limit, or maybe even not that. Uh, but uh, may I request you to go to a website called isro, I-S-R-O dot org. Um, it is the website of the Indian Space Research Org uh, Organization. You'll see the range of activities that they have because the Indian Space Research Program, in fact, is quite unlike those of the Western countries. It has a very development-centric focus. So it enables our people in terms of forestation, in terms of cropping, in terms of fishing, uh, in terms of a whole range of uh, developmental activities that are undertaken. We are in the process of putting into operation a seven satellite system called Gagan, which will be our version of the GPS. And for this part of the world, it will give us a far better resolution than the GPS system does. Uh, and, and there are all sorts of discussions that are underway between our, um, our experts, uh, including uh, we've offered for your very ambitious Mars program, because as I said, we are one of the three countries, I think, that has actually sent a probe to Mars, and it has been exceptionally successful. It has, uh, the evidence collected by the Indian probe is often cited for evidence of water on Mars. Please. Uh, thank you, Your Excellency, the Ambassador, uh, for this uh, wonderful lecture. My name, uh, I'm, actually, I'm one of the uh, biggest fans of Indian culture. I'm glad that you speak Arabic. That is why I'll speak Arabic as well. Uh, despite that I speak uh, several languages, including uh, Hindu uh, and uh, including uh, Urdu. Uh, and they are wonderful languages, and I'm very glad uh, with this culture. Uh, please, with your permission, Your Excellency the Ambassador, uh, how many Emirati tourists? I hope that uh, there are many uh, uh, dialogues to ensure that uh, uh, the uh, Emirati nationals uh, obtain visas to India. Uh, an e-visa system, um, and UAE is covered in that e-visa system. It uh, is available both for uh, tourism and for medical purposes. You don't need to go to any visa office. You get on your computer. It takes about 10 minutes to fill in the online application form and upload your photograph. Uh, and within maximum 72 hours, but usually within 48 hours, you get the uh, response back. You print that out. That's your visa. Uh, and that's good enough uh, for uh, double entry in case you want to go to India and then go on to some other country, uh, or if you want to go just to India, including, as I said, for medical purposes. Uh, that's working quite efficiently around the world in many countries. Um, on the business side, we uh, offer five-year multiple entry visas to Emirati businessmen, and I would encourage you. Um, our head of consular wing, Mr. Raja Murugan, is sitting here. So if anybody has a, a, a question or a concern on visa, uh, our, our chief is there. But our endeavor really is to make it as easy as possible for uh, our Emirati friends to, to travel. I will acknowledge that uh, part of our dialogue with um, His Highness Sheikh Abdullah and his team uh, is about a visa-free regime or a visa waiver. Now, the reality is that India doesn't do visa waivers for anybody. Uh, so it's a difficult uh, first step for us to take. Uh, and uh, keep your fingers crossed, that might happen. But until then, I would just say that the e-visa is an excellent option. It's hassle-free, and uh, it, 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 you, you don't need to go to anybody's office. Please, sir, in the back, please. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Peace be with all of you. Your Excellency Ambassador uh, uh, Navdeeb, uh, uh, good evening. Uh, since we are talking about the visa, a visa for uh, uh, j uh, businessmen, 
I believe that since uh, there is a strong collaboration between uh, the UAE and India, we can go beyond the, the issue of visa. I mean, uh, visa is uh, uh, has to do with uh, medication and so on and uh, medical treatment. But with your permission, we need to go beyond that limit since we already have uh, relationships. Uh, the second uh, question has to do with the, the, what journalist or writer said uh, at the beginning. His, you refer to the, the the mosque that was established at the time of Prophet Muhammad. Do you mean that it was established at the time of Prophet Muhammad's life? Or do you mean the one established at the time of Malik ibn Dinar? Please clarify this point. My understanding, uh, based on the uh, records that our historians have, is that this was a mosque established during the lifetime of uh, uh, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, in the state of Kerala in uh, Cochin. Um, historians will often differ, and, but the, the earliest entry of Islam into India, many people don't realize it, didn't come through the uh, Central Asian uh, invasions into India, but it came peacefully through the traders who were trading between uh, the Gulf and uh, India. They were the ones who, uh, who brought Islam and, in fact, Christianity and Judaism as well in, into India. So the uh, uh, historic records that I have seen uh, or I've uh, read about are that the first mosque in Cochin was built as early as 670 or something AD. But I can, you know, I can actually get you the exact date in a small Google search. Um, on the issue of visa, as I said, we have a certain regime in place which requires a visa for nationals of all countries. Uh, so whether you are an American or a Brit or a French or a German, you still need a visa. Um, it is a system that gets reviewed from time to time. But meanwhile, over the last three or four years, what we have done is put in place the e-visa. And that really does take a lot of botheration out of going and queuing up at a visa office or doing anything. And millions of people around the world are making use of the e-visa uh, facility. It is now accepted, the e-visa itself is accepted, I think, in 21 airports throughout India. Once again, we would like to thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, we'll take no more. Uh, we'll take no further questions at the end of uh, this uh, lecture. In the name of His Excellency Dr. Jamal Sanad Swedi, the Director General of the Emirates Center for Strategic Studies and Research, I'd like to express our gratitude and thank His Excellency Ambassador Navdeep Suri. And thank you very much for your attendance. And we hope to see you again in other scientific uh, sessions. Thank you very much, and peace be with all of you. Thank you very much, and a special Dr. Jamal Swedi.